Okay, the recording has been started. Welcome everybody to the second edition of uh, the FRC Sunday Night Call for this season. Tonight we have Carly, who's going to be leading our discussion on being a volunteer first. Um, I don't have any other news or information, so Carly, the floor is yours. Take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Carly. I am, uh, let's see, in order of recency, um, I am a lead mentor of a team here in Minnesota, 2500. Um, I am a volunteer. Uh, I've been a referee and a judge here in Minnesota. Uh, I was a scorekeeper back in California. Um, going further back, uh, I'm an alum of FRC. Um, and I'm also an alum of FLL. So I've had experience with kind of a lot of different sides of FIRST. Um, and in this discussion today, we're going to be talking about kind of what, um, what those different sides are um, and maybe um, get some ideas for, you know, why you might choose one side or another. At different points in my um, career and in my um, experience with FIRST, I've chosen, you know, to engage in different ways. Um, and We'll cover kind of what different ways there are to engage and why you might choose one over the other. At this time, I'd love for uh, Lori to introduce herself. Um, Lori is our volunteer coordinator for First Thing Ever Midwest, yeah? <laughs> yeah, slightly more than that. So um, we'll start yes. out broader and we'll come down smaller, but um, I'm the um, global volunteer coordinator for the FIRST Robotics Competition. And that means that, that I work with volunteer coordinators literally around the globe as we are working with our event committees around the globe to put together hopefully the best possible team experiences and competitions for, for our teams and our members and our, our mentors worldwide. Um, so that's the bigger picture. And then as we zoom in locally, I am now this year working with six different events. Um, we have five different event committees working on six events. And um, it's just going to be a blast here in the, the upper Midwest, starting week one, going all the way through through to the end. But um, I also mentor here locally, as well as I'm part of the FIRST Mentor Network. So I get pulled on as a resource, again, globally. Um, but that is, in a nutshell, what I do. So a lot of it is uh, volunteers 24-7. So, Carly, back to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, does, it just, you know, does anyone in the group have experience um, volunteering? Just if you want to share, go for it. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Stacey Foreman. I work with Team 2472 as the finance mentor. I'm also really actively involved in scouting. So seeing how volunteering is, is in roles are you know, different and the same uh, within different organizations working with young people um, is one of the reasons why I uh, logged in tonight. Awesome. I'm Scott. Uh, this is my 10th year as a mentor. I also am the treasurer for the nonprofit that runs the team, uh, 2052 Nightcrawler. I am also um, a volunteer on the board for the Minnesota State High School League Coaches Association. So I represent Section 4 and um, I coordinate our hub in the North, North Metro for teams in the North Metro. All right, well, everyone um, feel free to um, hop in with your experience. Um, I've got a couple of questions that will help structure the discussion, um, but everyone here has something to offer. Okay, the first question um, is, how is the experience different volunteering with a team versus at events? Has anyone had experience with this? Okay, I can, I can share my experience. Um, so, I, uh, I guess a year ago, I was a judge um, at lacrosse, North Star Lacrosse. And um, in that competition, I got to see many different teams. I got to talk with the students of the teams. I got to understand more about the robots, about their design flow, about you know how they made the decisions they did. And I feel like, uh, um, and I watched a lot of matches. So I got to see kind of the competition at a broad scale. Contrast that with, I think a week or two later, I was uh, a mentor with um, 
2,500, the team that I mentor. Um, and I was in the pit basically the whole time. We were cycling through um, the, you know, getting through inspection, getting through doing practice matches, making sure we show up on time to our matches, making sure the robot gets fixed when it breaks, um, you know, communicating with the machine shop that we need a major part rebuilt. Um, so there's a lot of pieces that um, I was focusing on um, when I was with the team. And I actually like didn't talk to any other team that event. Um, I like didn't didn't do any of the scouting, um, didn't do any of the like chatting with other teams. Um, so those were two like very different um, experiences for me volunteering with a team versus for the event broadly. Um, and I would say that that's kind of true to the other roles that I've taken on um, as a volunteer with events. Although I will say that there um, there's definitely roles so. You know, there's there's judges and there's referees, which kind of see all the teams. There's robot inspectors, which see most of them. Um, there's other roles like um, CSA, which might spend um, their time with like one team that's really struggling. Um, and so I think there's a, a variety of different, just in terms of at the events, how broad of the competition that you see um, is kind of my my perspective on like this is at an event, whether you volunteer with a team or broadly. Now there's also, you know, with a team, you're with the team for the whole season, right? So when I first dipped my toe into volunteering with FIRST, I knew I couldn't commit to a full season. And so I volunteered at an event. And that was a really great way to reconnect with FIRST after I had been an alum and then I'd been in college and then I was now ready to, to be a volunteer. Um, and there is just such a joy of immersing yourself wholly in this movement, in this environment that, you know, you can, you get to see everybody being really excited about what they're doing. Um, and it's, if you have the time to just be fully in that, it's very all encompassing. Um, and if you have time to just be fully in that, but you don't have time like year round, I would highly recommend volunteering at an event. Yeah. Do other people have other experiences? Yeah, I mean, I'm an actual student on FRC, but I volunteered uh, last year at FLL events as I'm an alum of FLL. Um, and so, yeah, I would say it's definitely interesting, especially since I volunteered for the St. Paul Public School tournament um, as a referee. And so it was really interesting sort of learning about how other teams sort of approach robotics um because it was very different from how i necessarily like the experience that i had um and so it was really interesting sort of getting that sort of diversity of viewpoints as well of like oh that's how one team approached this mission right and here's how this other here's how i did it and here's how this other team and so sort of getting to see sort of how these different teams approached the challenge and also sort of being able to inspire these students of being like, oh, I'm a high schooler. They can sort of see this is what they could do in high school, you know, in FRC. And that's, I think, a big part. I also, you know, volunteer with our FLL and FTC teams at my school. And so that's also a part of it as well of just sort of like sort of showing this progression through school, um, through FLL, FTC and FRC. Yeah, absolutely. That's part of why I really enjoyed being a judge as a, you know, I'm a software engineer for my day job. You know, I can show, hey, I'm an alum of the same program. This is where I ended up. Um, this is where, you, I mean, everyone takes a different path, but this is where you could end up. These these skills that I'm talking to you about are directly relevant to my work. So, yeah, it's really, really awesome to be that role model um, and to volunteer at whatever level is appropriate. Has anyone found it challenging to like have a team affiliation but volunteer? Uh, I guess volunteer not as uh, not just as a mentor for the team, volunteer more broadly. All right, yeah, that that's because there are many different um, roles that you can take and. Several of them do not, uh, many of them do not actually conflict with being affiliated with a team. 
So there's a, a lot of different roles that you can have at, at competitions. And if your team has a lot of extra mentors, send them our way. We, we, love, uh, <laughs> we love to have the help. Um, and it could be really easy to, to pop in and help, um, help on things and still cheer on your team. Yeah, go for it, Sam. Yeah, could you uh, go over what some of those roles are? I think we've had extra mentors at events and things, and maybe even people who maybe like kind of stray on like the shy, the sire, the the shyer side of things, and don't necessarily want to. They're a little maybe nervous to put themselves out there, jump for it. But so any any kind of description or anything, I can maybe uh, at least encourage some of ours and information for others. Yeah, absolutely. Lori, did you want to take this one? So there are anywhere from, you know, 100 to 120 different roles that we seek to, to fill at an event. And some of them are, um, you know, some of them are what we call non-technical, where you really don't need to be the, the technical robot whiz person. Um, but a lot of times it's somebody who is just, I think of it as you just want to be around, be involved. Um, get excited, um, help cheer on all of the teams, you know, and be encouraging, be that person, you know, you're that high five, that, that smile as they're, they're queuing up and they're, they're getting ready to take the field. The best part about it is that there's both, for a lot of roles, there's pre-event training that you do online. And then there's also what we do on practice day, no matter how many hours we get, during practice day, there will be practice for both. We call it both for the teams and for the volunteers. Everybody is kind of walking through all the different things that we're going to need to do to make sure that when we get to qualifications, when we get to the competition day, everything is moving as smoothly as, as it can. So it's one of those things where we often get to events and people are like, oh, wait, I, I can do this. And they, they want to join in at that point. It would be even better if we get them involved um, beforehand. There are the, um, the off-season events throughout the state, throughout the area, where they can, can come and, and talk to the volunteer organizers and coordinators that are on site. Um, we have a whole group of us that'll be at the Roseville event this coming Saturday, and then at the uh, EMCC and the, uh, the Mini Mini in Prior Lake in November as well. Please come and send them. Push them forward and say, hi, this is a new parent on our team. They'd like to be involved and be like, yay, here's how, how we do it. We can get them involved. But it's really hard. You don't know what it is. You haven't walked through it. You, you kind of see it. It looks exciting. Um, but just look for one of the key volunteers or, you know, I'll be at the MRI on Saturday. Would love to just chat with anybody who, who stops by. I'll put a couple of links in the chat that, that you can share with folks. Um, this year for the FRC game, they are bringing back the official scorers, which of course means there'll be probably a lot of things on the field. Um, you don't have to have any prior experience. All, everyone who's an official scorer is trained day of, um, to be that role. So that can be, you know, really a great place to put a, a new person who really is looking for, I have no idea what to do, but that's a great place to start. So I'll just put a couple of links in the chat for folks. Lori, for um, our folks that are going to watch this on their recording and they won't see the links, um, can you give us a reference to a website or something? Yep. All of the links that I'll be putting in, they are just, um, they're on the First Inspires website. If you look for um, ways to ways to help, ways to volunteer, you just have to click at the top of those tabs and, and the, these tabs are just going to drop down as well. How many of the roles that uh, are at a competition are well suited for somebody who's brand new to volunteering for first? Oh, can, let's can you see. mention some of them or or things that you think are great places for people to slot in? Yeah, because I'm staring right at Tom Semple. I'll say queuing. Queuing is a great place to start. Uh, field reset is a great place. To see. He's laughing. Um, official score this year. Um, the uh, field resetters. Um, any number of what we call those light admin roles, like um, helping at pit administration, helping with, with robot inspection, helping just be a meet and greeter. Um, for the, the Warner Coliseum event, which is new this year, we're looking for people who actually might know the state fair, know the buildings at the state fair, and might be able to, to help direct the traffic um, in, in that event. So everything is, it's really kind of wide open to a great extent because 
We need, um, there are 10 field resetters that are needed. There are five official scorers that are needed. There are at least, you know, three to four people needed at pit admin. It just starts, you can see, we just start taking in people um, as they, as they walk by. Not that I'm staring at Tom. Tom walked right into it and got pulled into a couple of things, but the best part for Tom, not that I'm I'm picking on you, sorry, because you're on the screen. The best part for Tom is that, as he'll tell you, you start in one role, but that doesn't mean that's where you end. You know, you, you can come up to a volunteer coordinator an event and say, this is just not working for me. And we will do our best to, to try to reconnect and put you in a, into a different role that um, might be better suited for you. So it's also very much a kind of a moving, mo moving kind of thing throughout the event. But volunteers don't get stuck in any particular in any particular role unless they really like it, like Carly, and want to stay there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've hopped around this season to season, and actually, my first volunteering was as an official scorer. Um, I think I mistakenly said scorekeeper early. I, official scorer was my uh, role, and. Um, if you are interested in like really getting into the game and the robots and seeing how everyone solves the challenge in a different way, um, any of these on the field roles, um, field reset, official scorer, um, referee, uh, queuing, um, all of those are on the field. And so you'll see the robots in action and you can see um, you provide a, you know, a calm voice among the, <laughs> the chaos. Sometimes tensions run high in queuing and, and whatnot. And, um, you can, you can provide, uh, that perspective. Um, Lori, you said, um, I'll let you, um, toss those in, in the chat first, um, but you mentioned, um, a key volunteer. What, what's a key volunteer and how do I identify who's a key volunteer? So the, there are 16 different roles that are identified as key volunteers, and that goes anywhere from the control system advisors to, to referee to our field supervisors, FTAs, game announcers, MCs, head referees, uh, judge advisors. And for the most part, if you are looking to become a key volunteer, there are some prerequisites. Um, it can be years of involvement, years of, years of, of doing the role um, before you, let's say robot inspector, before you then may want to become the, the lead robot inspector at an event. So there are, um, there are a, a, a number of, of prerequisites, but we try to break that down for volunteers so they don't seem truly really overwhelming. Um, you can look at it and say, oh my gosh, I need how many years of experience? I need to be in what role before I, I can move on? Um, and to try to demystify the key volunteer process, we have what we've developed here in, in the FRC Northland area, what we call a talent council. And these are longtime experienced key volunteers who are looking for, for the next people to essentially put into the pipeline to train to become the next generation, if you will. And it's every year, it's a different generation of referees and, and game announcers and um, judges, judge advisors. So, um, and these would be people who you would would meet at the events. So, so for instance, um, if you're at the MRI and you are visiting with our FTAs, David Day, one of our FTAs, is always interested in talking with people who are interested in looking at scorekeeper or the FTAA role. Because those are pretty much those um, preliminary roles that you would want to do as you were looking at perhaps working toward the, the FTA or the field technical advisor role. Um, head referees, we are um, bumping up one of our uh, longer time referees this year again into that head referee role. Some of you have met Andy Rehack from Bison Robotics. He is going to step into a head referee role this year as well. And he also will be at the, the MRI. A lot of the people that you see you know, as you are at going to the different events, you'll say, but wait, they were a referee. Oh, wait, they're a head referee now. How did that happen? And we would all be very happy to, to talk with folks, you know, put you, as we say, put you in the pipeline, get you some additional training, get you ready for success to be a key volunteer. Awesome. Thank you, Lori. Do we have any other questions around, um, you know, 
how the volunteering is at events. All right, for those alums in the group, I think we might have some. Um, I'm, I'm one, but uh, maybe there's others. Uh, what uh, was the role change from as a student to an alum um, and how did you navigate that? Um, both uh, on if you, you know, were a student of a team and then became an alum mentor or um, became a, a volunteer, was there like a, an aha moment in like how you thought about your role, both as a student and then as an alum. Go ahead, Ellie. Yeah, so I, well, I am on 25, Team 2502 Talent Robotics. I am now the head mentor of that team, but I graduated in 2017. I actually went to school at Bradley University. So right before COVID, I uh, volunteered there for two years. And then during the COVID years, I mentored virtually and helped out with some of those online things and kind of filled the role as lettering mentor. And then I think it was an easier transition when I came back in person, just because I was able to take on kind of a mentor role before being in person. So that transition wasn't as rough, but I was lucky enough to be at a college campus where there was a first game happening and I didn't go home for spring break just because it's an eight hour drive. And I was like, there's a first robotics competition here. I'll be fine. Um, so I was able to kind of do that in my spare time, which was fun. Yeah, that's actually a good note. Um, if you are um, a student who is looking at graduating soon or a recent um, alum of FRC and you're at college, maybe you're in a state that you um, haven't been to before, reach out to the local first community and they would love to have you as a volunteer. Um, you don't have to just be in the Midwest or in, in Minnesota. Yeah. Um, Ellie, did you oh, go ahead, Dominic? Yeah, um, I know for our team, we have a rule of four years after people graduate, then they can come back as a mentor. Um, I know some other teams have similar of whether it's one year or four years or whatever. Um, and so I know that's at least what we've done. And we now have three or four different mentors that have that are alumni of the team. And that's been really helpful as well for sort of preserving that knowledge as well. Um, and sort of bringing back that, oh, this is how we used to do it. Um, and here's how we're doing it now. And so coming back to mentor, either your team or another team is also a great sort of way of sort of spreading ideas between teams as well. Yeah, absolutely. Did you, were there anything, uh, was there anything that you found that newer mentors, newer alum mentors, like mistakes they were making or kind of traps they were falling into that maybe we can share with our, with the broader group so that they, you know, people can get up to speed as to how to volunteer as an alum faster? Uh, I think one sort of pitfall that we had this year um, was one of our students who had just graduated basically was the only programmer who knew how to program our Swerve robot. Um, and fortunately, he went to a local college um, so he could come back just a couple practices and sort of teach the rest of the programmers. But sort of making sure that the people who are just graduating, you know, can share, have shared that knowledge um, with the rest of the team or with mentors or whatnot. Um, because that's super important um, just to, for the longevity and sustainability. Um, but other than that, our four-year rule has been pretty, pretty good because we found that, you know, once after four years, all of the students who you are on the team with have now graduated. And so you don't necessarily have any of those weird dynamics of we used to be students together and now one of us is a student and one of us is a mentor. Um, and so it's worked out pretty well. Um, for us. Absolutely. Actually, um, making sure that when you leave the other, you know, the rest of the team still knows what to do and is, uh, you know, knows, uh, has enough knowledge to carry on is, is actually a huge theme, you know, in industry too. Um, and so it's great that you're, you're thinking about that, um, even as a, as a high school team.
I guess I, I can found- share- Oh, yeah, go for sorry, it. Sorry, Carly. <laughs> I, was saying, I can share some of my experience. Yeah, I graduated in 2011, um, came back and mentored, uh, mentored the actual team I graduated from five years later, I guess, and then ended up as the lead mentor the year after that. And uh, I just think there's a uh, there's such a transition between being a student on a team who's trying to compete and get things done versus focusing on, it's both education and it's not that the coach doesn't want the team to achieve its goals, whether that's competition, whether that's impact, whether that's inclusivity, whatever it is, just making sure you're rowing in that direction with your team and also making sure that, you know, you're centering it around the student experience and not just achieving those goals to any end, if that makes sense. Um, I think, you know, you've seen, seen teams who, or you've seen even the polls with new mentors and things, just trying to get things done versus centering it around the students. And I think it's especially hard because, or it's really up to your team to define those roles because first doesn't, which, you know, is of course kind of a cornerstone of the program, but there's no, there's no guide. There's no YouTube video. There's no nothing saying here's what a mentor should do. And here's what a mentor shouldn't do. And I, I guess I would even encourage um, lead mentors on the call to try to define those roles early with your mentors, especially former students um, saying, you know, here's what, here's what we expect on a team for a mentor to do and not to do. And apologies, I'm cutting out. I'm, I see my connection's not the best, so. No worries. I, I heard you ask uh, lead mentors to, uh, you know, help help the teams define, you know, what mentors should and shouldn't do and set those expectations early. I, I found that, you know, it's always good to set those expectations before the season, too, um, especially because if we have, like, a formal mentor, there's, like, a process with the school we have to go to, go through. Um, and so, like, what is it, what level of involvement constitutes, you know, going through that effort? Um, it's interesting to think through. And I think there's also different mentors for different parts of the robots, right? Like, as lead mentor, currently, I mostly, like, coordinate the other mentors. And, um, you know, I talk with the students a lot as well. Um, but mostly it's in getting them to define a strategy. Um, and so I, you know, talk to them and I'm like, okay, what, what are we doing um, and then, you know, get, getting them in control of, of what we're doing. And then, then some amount of it is also like telling other mentors, like, Hey, now is the time to take a step back. Um, let's, let's let the students lead here. Um, it's interesting to think about the mentor mentor dynamics as well. Scott, did you have something to add? I was going to let it roll, but since you asked, um, so a couple of things for Nightcrawler. We also have the rule that um, you can't be on the team if anyone was on the team when you were on the team. So in your fourth year, you can come back um, and be a mentor. And we've had, we've had in the recent years, actually, we've had a, a handful do that. Um, in the early years that I was on the team, I hadn't seen that happen. But in the last, well, since COVID, we've had a number of um, alumni come back in their fourth or fifth year. Um, one student came back who went to a tech college. So they were working and they were able to come back on their fourth year because they were already out of school. And um, it's worked out well. We really haven't had any issues with that other than um, young adults over committing their time and realizing I uh, I don't really have this time with my new job life to, to be at school every day of the week like I used to when I was a kid. Um, one thing I was going to say about onboarding new mentors, we had something sort of an aha moment that you were mentioning last year with a new mentor. Um, we had two new mentors last year, two engineers, um, and one of them, we told her, you know, figure out, you know, we'll answer any questions for you. Um, I think she was working on the build team and we said, we'll plug you in anywhere that you feel like it makes sense. See if there's something that makes sense to you. And um, she would come once a week and then life got busy and she said, I just, I just can't keep doing this. And, and um, we didn't, wasn't able to, to sort of lock her into the program. The other mentor came in and she was asking, you know, what can I do this and that? And we gave her a job. We said, we need somebody to teach the kids path planner. So can we have an adult work with these students who want to learn path planner? And the aha moment was give a new mentor a job. Um, because it definitely plugged her in much quicker. It gave her that sense of belonging and that sense of kind of need for the team. And here's a way it can actually help. 
Um, and so that worked out really, really well for us. She had never done anything with first before she was brand new to the program and everything. Um, and man, did she plug in, she did such an amazing job, um, for us. And, um, we're so excited that she's part of the team. And I, I, I think that we would have had more of a toss up of whether we would have been able to keep her had we not, you know, given her a piece of responsibility that she could take ownership of and have that pride and just really get plugged in with the students. So that's my tip for new mentors. Oh, yeah, I, one other thing I want to say about um, the four year role, one of the we, we mentioned the whole transition from being a student to being an adult and how important that gap sort of is. Um, it, it also is very helpful for YPP. Um, you don't want to get in a situation where you have a 19 year old recent graduate playing online games with kids that are still in school. Um, and you, you need to have sort of that emotional or, or um, cultural break, maybe is the right way to say that, where um, being away for one year doesn't just automatically make you act like an adult. And so having a bigger gap helps to ensure some of those YPP things don't come up. Yeah, absolutely. And it also helps to ensure that you're less personally invested in the success of the team and more able to separate like the success of individuals within the team and the success of the team as a team rather than as the robot um, performing. One of the things that you mentioned was really insightful of giving someone a job. Um, that's one of the things that I didn't even realize that we did. Um, we had a new mentor who is also an alum. And I was like, your job is to make sure that we're on time to all of the things we need to be on time to. Um, and that was really helpful just to, you know, especially as a, as a lead mentor, just to delegate um, that. And then I, I could focus on other things like making sure the robot had uptime or like structuring the conversations, the debriefs in the pit. Um, and we also, also rotate through mentors in the pit to make sure that like people have times they're on and times they're off. That really helps. I think anything that you're doing with your students. So for example, we have a student pit rotation as well. It's nice to have sort of a, a mentor equivalent. And then also you can, you can model the mentor equivalent and then hope that the kids pick up on, you know, this is how you uh, can structure it too. One other thing that you mentioned, Scott, um, sets us up really well for my third and final question. Um, how do you balance continued involvement with FIRST with the rest of your life, just in terms of like balance of not getting, not spending all of your time um, doing, <laughs> doing FIRST um, and making sure that you're also nurturing the other parts of your life? I have zero advice for this. Um, I could yeah, say this yeah. is one that I'm, I'm working on. I've, my youngest is now a senior. So uh, it, it, it kind of going to the other, to the point that Scott made it giving new mentors a job. Uh, last year we had more new mentors at 2472 than frankly, at the beginning that we knew what to do with. And we've restructured a little bit and redefined some roles and gave more prominent roles to those that have the, the time because they're retired or semi-retired, uh, more direct student time. And others of us are more support mentors that come in with more specific expertise, if you will. Uh, and that at least here in preseason seems to be working out well and takes some of the pressure off of you're trying to balance, you know, your regular job that brings in the money and, and, and the volunteer stuff that you want to do. And, and in doing some meetings over the summer to all be on the same page, um, some of the mentors last year, we were, everybody had the best intent. So I don't want to take away from everybody, but everyone's vision of what that looked like was a little bit different. And so we were able to take some of the off season this year and put some of those new tools in place to try and get people a little bit more aligned and maybe more specific. It was great. Everyone wanted to help. And now some of those folks that maybe got a little overburdened last year are going to focus on maybe just the logistics part of stuff and not try and be there and be a programming mentor too. Um, so that's one thing that, that we learned trying to double check with your, your mentors just as well as your kids that they're not getting overwhelmed and that they're keeping, you know, some sort of balance in, in their life. It's, it's a, 
it's hard because you do want to be there all the time for the kids, um, especially in that the busy build season. Yeah. One thing that my team has done to stabilize that is during the off season and also during the build season, we ask mentors to like commit to a specific day a week or multiple days a week um, and then come at that regular time. So for instance, I came Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, and the students, you know, if they had a question for me, they knew that they could reach me on our discord, uh, but they could also reach me over um, the, you know, know the days that I would come in and kind of align their days. Um, and, you know, I would come in ad hoc as well if ne needed, but, but being really clear with the students um, as well as the other mentors, like I can commit three days a week to this um, in the off season. I can commit one day a week to this. Yeah, that really helps. One other thing, does the results yet to be determined? We had our, our parent meeting for new you know, fall season students um, just last week and trying to encourage more parent participation for things that maybe mentors also ran, like some of the fundraising activities, if we're going to go bag groceries at Cub or do some of those things so they can have maybe a, a one-time opportunity to be involved um, and not have mentors be responsible and coaches be responsible for that too. I guess we'll have to report back later on how successful we are with that. Nice. Um, I want to ask, um, because I, the the team I was on as a student did things differently from the team I am on now. Um, the team I was on as a student, we stayed at the school and then worked in the evenings, which allowed uh, mentors who work a nine to five to attend our meetings and help us. Uh, but the, the students, the team I'm on, Currently, we meet immediately after school. Uh, I'm curious if other teams have thought about this in terms of, you know, balancing mentor time um, and balancing student time and kind of the thoughts you've had and, and how it's balanced up. Um, I can share that Nightcrawler meets from six until nine, six until eight uh, or six until nine. Um, and it's for twofold. One is that way we can get the mentors to show up, but our space is a shared space. It's not available to us after school. Um, there's another program that's in there um, in the space that we share. So it just isn't an option. Well, unless the schedules would be switched around, but they've been this way for quite some time. So um, it's sort of out of necessity for the school, but it also works great for the mentors this way. It does create a transportation challenge for students that can't drive and whose parents work evenings. Um, but that's the way we've been running things. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, yeah, so with Talon Robotics over the years, we actually all run pretty long days. So we might run directly right after school and then go right into the evening but what we do is we do time slicing for mentors. So mentors can choose to be there for like a two hour slice and then hand off. So rather than, unless they really want to, a mentor doesn't have to stay there the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. Michelle, did you have something to add? Oh, I was just gonna add to like for 2052, you know, the other piece, though, too, then, is we've worked on uh, ride share for the students so they can ask for rides amongst each other and things like that, um, because it is hard. And it's it's hard. And, and a lot of these kids, truth be told, end up staying the whole time at the school alone um, because they've got practice or things like that for the sports they're in before they come to robotics. So, but I think it just as a team, then you have to be aware of that and maybe some different needs to work around that too with the evenings. But there's there's no way I'd be able to volunteer if it was right after school with the work that I do. Um, and that can be a challenge too for, for us because um, we only have a few mentors that are available for school time or right after right now too. Uh, kind of going in with what Eric said, we are fortunate to have a pretty big mentor base 
um, we're doing lots of conversations too about the culture and if everyone does a little bit, no one has to do a lot kind of with that sharing times, but we're also making it easier for people to say, Hey, I can't do this. I've committed too much and take a step back when needed. So that way it's not like, ah, crap, you're dropping the ball, but it's more of a like, nope, we're communicating healthy boundaries and kind of doing that with the students. So the students are able to express that with the mentors. Um, our program is typically during build season, three to nine or nine to nine on weekends. But, and sometimes we'll take a day off in there, but it also gives the students the opportunity to be super accessible for them. So if they're in other programs where they have, or they're able to come in where they need to, and they have that flexibility where if they can't come back like three to six, then they can stop by six to nine and they have different options. And we're working on making kind of our meetings more accessible by having online options for our mentors who live 20, 30 minutes away instead of five minutes like some of us, just so everyone's able to have a voice and have a say while not being too overwhelmed. So... Uh, to add on to that, again, what we do is we maintain a sign-up uh, with time slices, and that way we can make sure that the students are covered. And uh, if we see that there's a hole there, then somebody can then volunteer. If they see that people already signed up uh, to cover, then you say, like, okay, we, I don't have to be there that night, but if you see a, a hole, uh, then we can try and keep it filled. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, some of us can get too in the weeds or in, invested because we think that if we aren't invested in this way, it's gonna all fall apart. Um, and so you know, being able to communicate to each other as a mentor team um, you know, that, that we have each other's backs and that, that we can all trust each other um, in, a, in a way that, you know, allows me to step back. I'm no lead mentor. I'm not there every day. That's, mm -hmm. that's okay. Um, uh, but I know that when I'm not, I have other mentors who I really trust that, that are there um, and that will also communicate um, back about, you know, anything I need to know about. The other thing is that we are extremely student run team. So we do not, uh, for the most part, we don't need knowledgeable mentors there. We just need to have adults in the room, uh, which makes it a lot easier. There could be parents who have no skills, just willing to be there, and that's just fine uh, because of our style. Yeah, well, no, we have a Slack channel and the students are working more in what we call the design review committee. And that's how we get a lot of our alumni back. So I think Talon has uh, somewhere between 10 and 11 alumni that have come back to mentor in some capacity. So we do have our role on our team is one year. And we try to do some of the like, hey, it's OK that you're in college. But like if you want to do Slack and give opinions, because, you know, they're going to discuss anyway. So kind of doing it in a little bit more of a formal way. So they're able to say, hey, like we have this idea, is this going to work? And they're gonna be able to kind of give input on that and kind of help them think through that without necessarily being there in person. And that also gives way for a lot of our parents to get involved and kind of understand, oh, this is what robotics is. Um, Cause they're able to be there with their kids and still have that involvement, which is really awesome. Absolutely. At least for our team, you know, figuring out what robotics actually is, is attending a competition. Um, and so I'll put another plug out there for attending MRI, you can volunteer, or you could just show up and see what it's about. Um, it's happening next Saturday. Um, it's a, a local to the Twin Cities. Um, if you're, if you're curious, if you have people who are curious about what this whole thing is, um, I highly, highly recommend um, showing up. Yeah, Dominic. Yeah, I also think I remember someone saying something about like team culture and like one thing that's really worked well for our team is having multiple different like retreats. So I know um, about a month ago we had our mentor retreat. So all the mentors went up to a cabin and um, you know, sort of discussed over the weekend, you know, like, what do we want this year to look like? And sort of having that sort of discussion of, okay, 
especially for the new mentors, you know, all right, you're now a mentor. What does that mean? And then we did the same exact thing with our cap, our student captains, um, sort of looking at what does it mean to be a captain? What does it mean to like, what are you sort of hoping for this year? And then we're actually doing that next weekend um, with the entire full team going up to a cabin. And so that's a really important way that we set our culture on Nomethic of, you know, this is what we're expecting of you. This is what we want out of you. And also here's how we trust each other and sort of get to know each other in a more casual sort of format as well of, um, and I think that's really helpful um, in terms of, yeah, building trust, building that culture um, that we're known for and that sort of thing that sort of make sure that everyone is really invested in the team because they got to sort of see how passionate we are. Like, you know, taking a Saturday and going to our coach's house, right, as student captains, you know, we can really say, yeah, we are really dedicated to this and, you know, we're really invested in making sure that this team is successful. Go for it, Sam. So for those who are kind of on a mentor rotation, I was kind of curious. Um, we've had some, I don't know, at least internal discussion about uh, having like non-technical mentors there while technical things are being done. For example, if you have someone who's mostly involved in fundraising and students are running a robot or running a CNC machine or running something that the mentor maybe, if something's going awry, they may not notice. I mean, have, have teams thought that through? Do they have any solutions? Do they have some kind of minimal threshold of like, you know, unless you have a mentor there who's like trained on the chop saw, no chop saw running and things like that. Um, I, I know it's been kind of a sticky area for us or something we've even talked with our school administration about, you know, um, who should, who should be allowed to open up the shop space or what level of training do you need for that? I, I mean, I think it really kind of started with a parent saying, oh, I can open the school or the room after school, but uh, maybe some uneasiness with you know, really just kind of an adult with no technical background, unlocking the door and, you know, letting them have at it, basically. We well, have sign-offs on equipment and uh, the students need to be trained. Uh, they train each other, but they are not allowed to touch any of the equipment or the CNC unless they are particularly have signed off as being trained. Uh, does it's not the adults there that have any responsibility other than to be there because the students are trained to use it. Uh, but that's that's how we do it. So all a uh, specific sign off on equipment. Yeah, I, I would agree that like if you have your students getting trained, maybe the. the um, men, non-technical mentor gets trained to the same level or or maybe they're just there to call 911 and in that case knowing what to call 911 for is actually the most helpful training they can get it's not like actually there here's how you use the drill press we also do following with YBP the two mentor rule so that way if something happens um, one student or one of the mentors can focus on the situation um, with the injury or whatever is happening and the other can focus on kind of managing the rest of the room and doing what needs to be done. But for the most part, our students, because they get, a, they get a lot of leniency with using tools and stuff that they're very good about making sure that everyone's using them safely. So that way their privileges sounds like a strong word, but just so that way they don't lose the leniency they have with the school. So especially we're getting a lot of our, freshmen trained right now so that way they're ready for many trials so even when they're fully trained some of the more senior members will still kind of keep an eye out for them and this year we have um kind of those rainbow loom bands that you're going to put on the side of your sun, uh, safety glasses to show what tools you're signed off on and what you can they can't do just to make sure that it helps kind of give that key and make sure everyone's following along but we've been really fortunate that we haven't had you know, any major injuries or anything that comes with the current, um, because we work with our students just to make sure that we're keeping safety in mind when they do things. And they kind of instill that in their culture just to make sure that if they're doing things, they're all kind of keeping an eye out for them.
So we actually have a one of our subgroups is actually a safety and organization group. So it is uh, organized by that lead to uh, keep all these things appropriate and make sure everything, all the training is done correctly and that, but that is actually uh, a subgroup just like programming or anything else, our safety is a subgroup. Um, if nobody has any other thoughts, I'd like to ask about the role of parents um, as volunteers. How I see some teams uh, use parents for, you know, staffing um, the practices, uh, making sure people are there, obviously helping with transportation, transportation and such, and um, and fundraising a little bit. How does your um, team think about? parent volunteers and especially parent volunteers helping at the same time as their students are on the team. Uh, I know that some of our students are very averse to having their parents around. I think one thing is um, for my team, I'm a part of 4009. Um, when we have our parent meeting, um, we tell them, hey, uh, we'd love if you're on the team and you can do other stuff that you aren't like re working related with your kid. And we like doing that. Cause then there's no like weird, like, Oh, are they getting special treatment or like the parent might not want to tell their kids they're doing something wrong. Um, so we do kind of like to suggest, Hey, maybe if your student is working on the build side, you help out with business. Cause you're, that's kind of what your job is focused on. Um, and we have a yearly sound auction that we like to really put on the parents. Um, cause, um, we love putting it right between, uh, Minnesota state and world. So that's a lot of fun when like, uh, you go to worlds in like week five and you have a week to prepare. Um, so we'd like to kind of have that be the event the parents do throughout the year. Cause it's just going to businesses asking for items. Um, and they're a lot better at asking for items cause they have those contacts, but we also, we're wanting to get, I guess, parents more involved, trying to figure out how we can add them on our Slack channel without them having direct communication with our students. So I've, I'm kind of answering the question by asking another one. Does anyone know how to do that? Because we want more parent involvement where it's not sending an email and we hear no response. And obviously Slack would work great for that, but we obviously want this like um, roadblock so parents have no opportunity at all to contact students or vice versa. But I, I think parents are, a great opportunity because then after they all join when their kids are on and then their kids will graduate and they're like this is a lot of fun why not still do it and then they become uh, some of our best mentors but yeah so ben can you clarify you're asking for advice on how to communicate with parents so right I, I yeah so we have we have an email list um that we send out but um it's a lot hard for parents to respond to emails it feels like then um, a direct like Slack thing. So we're kind of working on this and I'm kind of going behind the back of mentors are trying to figure it out. So if anyone's watching 4009, sorry. Um, but um, like in Slack, does anyone know, is there a way that we can have parents have one SIP channel that that's the only one they can access? And you, like, yeah, yes, you can, but it's a lot of work. Um, okay. We did that for a while because you can't just send them an invite link. Um, because right. then they get dropped into general and random and whatever your mm -hmm. default channels are. And then you have to go and remove them from all those other channels and just put them in the pan art channel. Um, last year, we tried something new, which I think worked better. Um, we created a booster Slack. And so we um, sent an invite link to all of our parents to join the booster Slack. And then, of course, we don't kick anybody out after their kid graduates. And so mm -hmm. to your point of it's a great way to kind of have them hang around. Um, they might their kid may have graduated and then suddenly they see they have a Slack notification like, oh, right, yeah, the robotics is starting up soon. I forgot about that. I should check and see if they need any help. Um, so we also, um, we have a paid subscription to MailChimp now. Um, the Sunday night call emails go through MailChimp and we were we send out an email to students and parents every week as well. So because we were sending so many emails, we now have a, a paid because we have too many subscribers on our MailChimp, but it's actually not very expensive. It's it's cheaper than I thought it was going to be. 
Um, but we send out a weekly email to parents and students of what's happening this week and, you know, like important dates down the road as well. So we do both email and Slack um, to stay engaged with parents. So for, sorry, uh, for Booster Slack, is that different than our regular Slack channel? Is that like it's, a second? It's two different organizations. I think we, I think it's set up as two separate organizations. Okay. Um, I think when you go to Slack and you say, you, you've already done this uh, apparently for your team where you've said, I'm setting up team uh, 2491, right? Um, you're setting up your team and then you set up a new organization, a, you know, a free or nonprofit or however you've got it set up, set up. So you, you need to administer two entirely separate slacks. Yeah. There is a way someone told me, Brian, I think it was Brian who he administers the slack for our team. I think there is a way that you can sort of share announcements across two slacks, or you can say that if you're in this one, you get to be in that one. But the whole permission thing is, is complicated and honestly two entirely separate organizations is is probably good i mean i'm in a half a dozen slacks being in two for nightcrawler is really nothing extra for me i know um how one of our mentors has figured out how to do separate things within our single slack channel or single slack organization we have like parents we have alumni we have our, the mini trial planning happening in our Slack channel somehow. I don't know how he does it, but if you have questions, you can email our team email and Emilio might get back to you. Um, he somehow did it. Um, and it's a bit of an adventure, um, but I don't know how he did it, but he did. But that awesome. might also be with our Slack premium. Uh, okay, so what, what team are you with? Just so 2491 no mythic no mythic awesome thank you yeah yeah i know our team um also has a variety of permissions in discord um so like for example we have travels for the travel team or channels for the travel team um just so we don't like clutter up the uh, other things with like coordination like oh we're going out to dinner at this place Just in general with parent involvement, just with the nature of robotics and how so many things can happen, um, just like safety and stuff, we like having parents in the room just so they understand kind of like, oh, my kids are doing this and they're a little bit more aware of like, oh, this is what happens and this is robotics. But it's also a good way for them to stay connected. So anyone who is like, yeah, I want to mentor. We do have them get background checked by the school. They go through a volunteer orientation with the school. And then we have them go through, obviously, the first um, youth protection training. We're also doing kind of more conversations. So, like, they're welcome at our mentor meeting. So, they can kind of get a taste and kind of start with that to see if that's something they want to be interested in. Otherwise, if it's like, hey, I am willing to help out, but mentoring is too much, like being in the room. We've also had a lot of our parents do like organizing food at tournaments and kind of helping run that and donating snacks and stuff when we travel. So that way they're still able to help out um, and provide for the team without it kind of being an overwhelming level. Uh, my thing, a group of our parents, like we go to the um, uh, garage the parking deck um at 10k and they kind of do a bunch of meals and kind of get stuff prepped and like cards and it's really sweet and we couldn't do anything without them obviously because our parents are our life and blood but it's also since we meet so much we have a lot of kids that they do spend all of their time at robotics so it's a way for them to kind of interact with their students on a level that they're comfortable with we're fortunate that we haven't had many issues in regards to like parents and students interacting because a lot of that just happens in the room and because they're in the room they're able to talk to people kind of one-on-one -on -one. but anyone that's kind of like in a room and in our space are mentors and we kind of have different levels so we have with our organization we have four captains we have 11 leads and just general students so we kind of have that same structure with our mentors so we have the head mentor works directly with the captains um a finance 
mentor and kind of an advisory board for questions on last minute situations. We then have 11 mentors who work with the students directly in those sub teams to make sure they're supported. A lot of those end up being parents. And then we just have our general mentor base and our general mentor base are usually like, Hey, I'll cover the room for an hour and a half, two hours. Um, and just help kind of fill that time because the students and the students don't really have an issue with their parents being there just because they understand that like, Oh, robotics is open a lot and we need the support to have people there to have it open. So they're usually pretty comfortable with either their parent coming in or they'll kind of work together to figure out what schedule is best for them. But they have that flexibility to decide. Cool. Uh, I don't have any other structured questions. <laughs> so. Uh, feel free to keep chatting or, or we could call it. Um, Scott, I defer to you. Uh, I have a question about going back to volunteering at events. So oh, I'm, yeah. working, I'm working hard to get a handful of new volunteers from Nightcrawler to participate. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about regionals in the Metro this year is that the two Metro, two metro regionals are on two different weekends. So it makes it possible for a team competing at one to have their mentors volunteer at the other. Um, so I am actually interested in that opportunity, if, assuming that I'll be in town when that happens. Um, but I'm curious, the Flory is still listening. Um, if I'm going to send you a couple of names, hopefully tomorrow, but if I have more people that are interested on Saturday, do we come, can we come talk to you on Saturday? How do we, oh, yeah. how do we introduce people to that? Even if they're late to the party? Um, I'll be there Saturday. Uh, we have a, especially at the off seasons, we do a kind of a welcome meeting right ahead of the driver's meeting. So okay. right after that, um, I'm pretty much available and circulating and, and talking with hopefully as many people as possible at the okay. event. So that's, that's always a good time. The other nice thing about the MRI this year is that, um, we have some new people who are stepping into the role of volunteer coordination at events. They're going to be working on site in, in different ways. And um, several of them will also be present. So it is an opportunity to say, I might be going to fill in the name of the event. And there's a good chance that, that there's a volunteer coordinator there who would be happy to be that face, you know, okay. kind of, it's, it's a lot easier when you kind of see somebody, I think is the best way to put it. Yeah. You know, you just kind of, you, you start to have a conversation and that's really what it's all about. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I, like I said, I'm, I had hoped to pull together names on Friday last week and then I had to go out of town. So working for this week, um, I want to do my best. I think I've got a, I think I've got two or three who are like, yep, I'm in. So I just got to connect the dots with those folks. Sure. They, they, I think their kids have graduated and they're missing it. So it's a great opportunity to pull them back in. Yeah, and you make you make a good point. We're we're upping from five events last year to six events in the region this year. So we'll need what is that? Twenty percent more people. Uh, Something like that. Yeah, twenty percent more volunteers. I mean, we could reprise our roles, but what's the fun in that? You got you want to mix it up a bit. Um, I'm willing to call it early if there isn't anything else. It's it's actually kind of nice every now and again to have a little bit extra free time on a Sunday night. So um, does anyone have anything else? Oh, how about this? As long as we got some extra time, who wants to suggest something that we do in the future and then volunteer for it? <laughs> I, we, I don't know that. I Let me. Well, actually. I had it up. Where is it? I think I had up the sign up sheets and I don't think we have anyone else signed up um, for any future sessions. So does anybody have any topics they'd really like to see? And even if you're not willing to host the topic, um, I can see if I can find somebody who is. Scott, I thought you were talking about, you know, parts of the first community mm -hmm. that we uh, 
you know, events that we wanted to see or whatever. We oh. definitely is the, uh, um, I, I've been on the alumni council and we'd be thinking about, are we going to, should we do meetups? Should we do, you know, should we settle on the alumni photo, um, which is uh, a hit at the events. Um, but then I like, see. if there's other kind of things for the community that people want to volunteer well, let's, for. <laughs> let's do that first. Is there any al alumni stuff? Let's do that first. And then we'll come back to mine of, I need people to host calls like you did tonight. So, um, yeah, I think that's a good question. Is anyone looking for outside of competition type of meetup events that they want to do either as a student or as an alumni? Or as a volunteer. Does anyone do that now? I mean, is there anyone already doing something like that? Can you hear me all right? We can now, Silas. Go ahead. Uh, I know CMRC does a picnic after every season ends for all the like central Minnesota teams. That's pretty cool. Yeah. The Nightcrawler uh, had been our second picnic picnic this summer. Um, the first summer we did it, we invited teams from section four, um, which were all pretty close to us. And then this year we opened it up to anybody that was willing to drive, uh, which was pretty much all of section four. You know, we had, we had some teams from, I think section three come as well. Um, but super fun. I mean, I really, really enjoy the summer picnic. So if you guys, uh, if, if anyone on here or listening on the YouTube, if, if you're not close to the Metro, organize a picnic and invite all the teams from around you. Man, what a great event. Um, I, I just, I hope we continue to keep doing that and it gets bigger and bigger every year because I just love that summer picnic that we do. Where's the one that's in central Minnesota? Uh, it's close to St. Cloud. I know Becker holds it. So. Okay. Yeah, Yurik does most of the organizing in that. So I'm is it in Becker then? Uh it's like in between Becker and St. Cloud. Okay. Well, I thought last time was in Monticello. Monticello. Monticello? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's great. Keep keep doing Scott, those things. In terms of like topics for the future, I'd be curious to know um future uh like um, mentoring with kids. I feel like a lot of Nightcrawler mentors might have a good perspective there. Uh, so yeah. that might be a good one for me. Yeah. And congratulations, by the way. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Unfortunately, we've lost a lot of Nightcrawler mentors who had kids. Um, I don't recommend sure. it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have much of a choice here, so I, I don't feel like I'm qualified yet to give that presentation, but uh, down the road, maybe. Um, really have that, to volunteer time until they hit FLL, right? <laughs> right. It, it impacts yep. our volunteers as well. Um, thankfully, I mean, in a very, very good way. But yeah, we're, we're feeling the impacts too as, as young folk are are going off and starting families and that has led to a lot of adjustments on the part of our event crews because yeah we're trying to to figure <laughs> out can we still keep you as a volunteer as a mentor but you also now have a lot more family yeah. responsibility as well and 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 balancing all of that so yeah what ryan let me know if you have figured this out i am all ears on this one we just got to buy like five to 10 years till we get that second generation <laughs> of volunteers in here. Then we'll be good. Yeah. Um, Jeremiah is probably the best one to ask. He takes his kind of now yeah. uh, Josiah is now a kindergartner. He takes Josiah to most of the meetings and it seems to work out pretty well. Um, I know that we have a kindergarten who will probably be at the beginning of several of our meetings this year um, until his other parent can come get him. So, right. You know, I, you make it work. You figure it out. It's it's hard with a little, little one. Really, really hard. But once they get to the point where they can walk and talk, it gets a little bit easier if you can keep them safely away from the dangerous stuff. We right. had one of our um, truly youngest members who really has been around since, I'll say, the very beginning of, of 1816 is now a sophomore in high school and a full member of the team. So um, wow. just had a kind of work our way through all those early years when um, they had to come with, with a parent, with a grandparent. And, and now we, you figure it out. You just kind of, you just kind of do, but it can, it can work, but you have to be flexible. Right. I yeah. remember a funny situation when I started mentoring, uh, 
I don't know how many of you know my grandson, Andy, who is a programmer who, uh, anyway, when he was about three years old, I needed to mentor. And I, the team babysat him while I mentored. I was doing programming back then. He's now just left for college. So, but he's gone through all the FLL, FRS, FTC. But yeah, the, they needed me enough that the, the team themselves were willing to babysit him while I was there. So sort of fun. On the topic of looking for um, new topics to present, we have a league meeting tomorrow. So I'll see if any of our students are willing to present or kind of bring anything up. I think one that might be interesting right before. They have homecoming this next weekend. So it's not really good for them. But um, we're, I think, training, especially with many trials coming up, would be a good discussion. But I'll talk to them and have us sign up if we can. Training was actually brought up. I think at the last meeting, we, we discussed, you know, what maybe we should just have a night where we get the build students on and the build students from all the different teams talk about their challenges of the training. And then we do the same thing with the programming team and mm -hmm. business PR media team and do those things. I, I would love, I would love, love, love to do something like that because I think it would be super beneficial for a lot of teams. I know we struggle every year with adjusting our build training to try to get better engagement, better skill building. Um, it, it's a struggle. I feel like we do okay now with our programming training, but it's a little bit more structured, you know, from, I don't know how to code until the point where you can build some basic robot code. It's a little bit easier, but with build training, especially when you only have so many drill presses and you only have so many, you know, saws or whatever, it can be really a struggle to get everybody hands on. Um, so I think it would be great to have that topic. Something else I was considering, you know, we've been doing this now for almost two years and we've covered a lot of topics and some of them twice. I had been considering, you know, maybe we should invite teams to say tonight we're going to learn everything about team ABC and the team comes in and talks about the team, talks about their history, talks about their structure, whatever they're interested in talking about. I don't know if we have teams that would be interested in doing that, but I think that would be interesting. And I think we'd also learn a lot about how different teams are organized. I know Nightcrawler does a lot of talking on these calls. Uh, Nomethic, you guys share tons and tons of stuff on these calls about how you run your organization. Um, I think it would be interesting and it might be a way to introduce the Sunday night call to students who just normally don't think about joining and, and kind of get them in there that first time. And then hopefully they come back. All right, does it, we used to do a um, challenge think tank and actually one of the reasons we do our most profitable fund or we do like a robots and rotini now was because another team said that was what they do for their like only funding i don't remember who it was um but now it's one of our like big events because we were talking to other teams so i think that's a really great idea that we can probably get talent on board with presenting about the yeah that. that would be great and i will say that talent you folks have also shared a lot of your team structure in the past and we really appreciate that um, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll put together a uh, kind of a, here's what we'd like to know type thing. Um, so that'll give some teams like, well, what would we talk about? Well, if we gave them a list of here's some eight bullet points that you, we'd love to hear about your team. Um, maybe that'll encourage some people to sign up off of the, the mailing list that goes out every week. All right. Yeah. It'd be interesting to contrast that with what you present for, for, for example, an impact award. Right. What are the additional um, yeah. kind of aspects? Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, if um, I will throw that out there in the next email, but by the way, I would really love to do training soon. So if, if Talon would like to do a training session, I'm a hundred percent on board for that because now's the time, right? We're all trying to figure out, all right, training didn't go so well last week. How are we going to change it next week? This is a great time to have those discussions because we're, we're just kicking that off for most teams. Um, but this might be a great topic for maybe November, December, try to pull in some team, even October, um, try to pull in some teams. And once a month or twice a month, we say, you know, meet a team and we have a, we invite a team in and they share everything about their team. Yeah, I'll, oh. see, if the, I'll see if our kids can make the sixth year. Okay, Just excellent. Pushing them a bit with MRI and uh, homecoming being on the same day already. 
<laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it's going to get real busy real fast for a lot of people. So we'll squeeze it in wherever we can. So if you, if, if you're willing to do it, pick a date that works for you and, and that'll be great. We'll talk to them tomorrow and try to get signed up. Awesome. All right. Anyone have anything else? Almost squeezed our full 90 minutes out. I think it's good enough to call it if it's good enough night. Carly, thank you so much. This was a great topic. And Lori, too, for all your content you've shared. I oh, really appreciate thank it. Thank Carly. <laughs> um, I think this is a great thank topic. And I think, for, yeah. I, I think that, you know, having these discussions about, you know, it's not so hard to, to volunteer or, you know, pick a volunteering thing that, that adapts to your schedule and your availability. These are great discussions to have. And, and if, if, if it gets a couple of more people to sign up, it was a worthwhile discussion. So thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Thanks for providing a forum and thanks everyone for attending and sharing your thoughts. Okay. Thanks everybody. Good night. Good night.